I grew up in a small suburb of Buffalo called Elma, New York. And uh, my dad was a farmer. He started out with a vegetable stand on Route 16 going in toward East Aurora. He always had an interest in the Asian culture and the Asian arts. So then he expanded and built a new store, and that was called Tujimoto's. I was toward the end of my college career, and I was upstairs studying. My dad sat at the bottom of the stairs and called me for dinner, and he said, hey, I got a call from the Sabres. And I go, really? I said, what did they want? The birth of the WHA in 1972 was a threat to the NHL. They were uh, running around signing players and signing amateurs. And they had signed it before the NHL had a chance to. So in 1974, the NHL, led by President Clarence Campbell, moved to protect its turf. The General Manners decided to have a secret draft. Instead of meeting in Montreal and sitting around tables, there would be phone calls to each team's hockey department. This was not a conference call. It was one call at a time. The process was painfully slow. You would hear Clarence Campbell then announce, is Buffalo on the line? Who's representing Buffalo? George M. Lack, you know, that kind of stuff. Between picks, teams had no idea who was being drafted. So every time Campbell made a call, he read and reread each selection, player by player. He would give you all the names and announce them in this dry, you know, lawyer tone. So it got deadly boring. The draft lumbered into its second day, and as the 11th round neared, Sabres GM Punch Imlach and Director of Communications Paul Wieland were inspired to have some fun. <laughs> the time came, and I was just sitting there, and we we're getting comatose practically. And I don't know what started it, but I think it was Imlach said the first thing we ought to draft someone that nobody knows about. So then we all jumped all over it, right? Yeah, that'd be funny, wouldn't it, if we drafted a, uh, What about a guy that doesn't really exist? Paul was the one who came up with the idea. There's no doubt in my mind about that. And then like anything to disrupt the usual run of things in the NHL, he was all for. Paul would, you know, would nudge this towards Punch and, yeah, go with it, go with it. Yeah, come on, we'll get those guys all up in arms. It was Wheeland who suggested they make the player Japanese and he knew instantly what the last name would be. When I was a college student, I drove down Route 16 to go from Buffalo to St. Bonaventure, and I would pass the Tujimoto uh, store, and that name just stuck in my head. But they needed a hand with character development, so they picked up the phone and called Joshua Tujimoto. He said, yeah, they wanted to know uh, what a, a Japanese boy's name was. So he said, Taro was a, was a real popular boy's name. And then they asked him, um, what's the Japanese word for sabers? And so he said, katana. So that's the Japanese samurai sword is a katana. We thought, boy, this is going to be funny because he's going to have to spell Taro Tujimoto back 16 times. So it came time, and uh, Buffalo ready? Yes, George M. Lack here, OK. Who does Buffalo select? He goes, Taro Tujimoto, and that was it. And it was fun. And we're just like holding our, you know, like covering our faces so we don't laugh. And that was it. Campbell didn't call them on it. Wheeland and Imlach had slipped one past the lead. We didn't swear secrecy, but we just came out of there and said, we're not telling anybody. The owners thought we had a Japanese hockey player coming. We never told them. So it was that Taro Tujimoto of the Tokyo Katanas snuck into the NHL record book. Come September, his name was on the Sabres training camp roster, and the team even had a stall set up for him. Everybody was wondering about this Taro guy. Like, you know, who's this, who's this Taro guy? Who's this Taro guy? Imlach kept up the ruse with reporters as well. And he's describing him. He says, well, we don't have full-time scouts in the Far East, but we had, we had this kid scouted, and he looks like it. We hope he comes to camp. And some writers actually bought it completely. They say, this guy's training in the Himalaya Mountains. He's the fastest skater to ever live. I said, they might even forget about the French connection. So 
The media just jumped all over. They thought it was the greatest thing going on. Taro never did arrive at training camp in 1974, but 40 years later, his legend lives on. Fans embraced Taro from the beginning, even though the Sabres wasted a draft pick on a fictional player. Two players that were drafted after Taro, Dave Lumley won two cups in Edmonton. Stefan Pearson won four cups with the Islanders. So, I mean, you think the Sabres could have had two really good hockey players. The 183rd pick in the 1974 draft was eventually ruled an invalid claim and Taro Tujimoto was erased from the books. In spite of that, he remains woven into the fabric of Buffalo's history. This is all part of it. It's chicken wings and beef on wick and Taro Tujimoto, and it's all part of the Buffalo you know, mystique. It's kind of stupid when you think of how it started, but it's kind of fun that people have an anchor thing that goes way back into the 70s that they can smile about and that they feel an association with player that didn't even exist.